missions. All right, Romans chapter number 7. Romans chapter 7. And uh, we'll be, we're going to begin reading here in verse 14. Romans chapter 7 and verse 14. The Bible says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Lord, we pray that you'll help us with some thoughts to our own heart before you tonight. And uh, challenge our, uh, allow us, Lord, we pray, I, I, I pray that you would help us to allow you, I should say, to search our heart, to try us, uh, and uh, Lord, to be sure that we are doing what we are doing uh, in a way that pleases you, and to help us, Lord, with the personal struggles that are illustrated here in Paul, help us to realize it's a common lot of sinful man, and then help us, Lord, we pray, to seek your face for victory in it that we might do all things pleasingly in your sight. Help me to preach your word and truth tonight. Thank you for each one that's here, our guests. Again, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this morning, uh, we, we were going on this topic to live sensibly. Live sensibly. And the point of the message was that uh, there is a balance to the Christian life that we find in, the, in obedience to the word of God. Uh, and that life is not a free-for-all, but God is a God of order. And you and I are to have lives of order. Well, we are to have principles by which we live uh, so that our testimony might be the very best that it can be for the Lord Jesus Christ and encourage people to come to Christ. Matter of fact, I mentioned to you this morning that if you uh, study out Romans 14 and uh, 1 Corinthians 8 through 10, you find out that Paul's number one concern was not himself, it was others. And as a matter of fact, he goes so far as to say that I'll eat no meat while the world stands if it makes my brother to offend. You and I are not to live for self, we're to live selflessly. We're to live for the sake of others. And Paul said, these things I do for the gospel's sake. And so as I said this morning, the, the burden and concern is that we have uh, in many ways such a free-for-all Christianity in our day that the testimony of Christ is, is lost in the world uh, and, and Christianity has lost uh, it, the bite and the conviction and the draw uh, because uh, so many of God's people are just, uh, instead of seeking to be like God, they're seeking to blend in with the world. And the Bible says, Come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. And so you and I are the ones that decide that. I mean, we don't, we, you know, as individual believers, we decide, I'm going to live for God. I'm going, to find, I'm going to get in God's Word. I'm going to find out what God's Word says. I'm going to live by the rules and principles and precepts that He sets forward. Uh, and uh, I'm going to do it, in, uh, I, I, should, I, I was going to say I'm going to do it in a sensible fashion, but if you obey the Bible, it's always sensible. Uh, and so if we'll follow his leadership, we'll have a sensible, balanced life that the Holy Spirit of God can use uh, that, will, that will help us to vanquish, to crucify self, and then to live for others uh, and a testimony that God can use to bring them to Jesus Christ. And so we talked uh, about, uh, again, uh, this, uh, this type of life, this uh, uh, type of, um, of uh, world view, life view to live, uh, to live uh, sensibly. Now, tonight I want to look at, a, look at this matter of living principally and uh, what that looks like. I know that we, uh, you, you know, making sure that the, the, the drive for why we do what we do is as it should be. 
And, uh, you know, we've quoted so often to you, I think it was Ben Franklin that said, Who hath deceived thee so oft as thyself? And if you and I are not careful, we deceive ourselves. Matter of fact, over and over the Bible says, Be careful that you don't deceive yourself. Make sure that you're living according to genuine truth um, and uh, not lying to yourself. Well, one person that knew about the struggle with self was the Apostle Paul, and he talks about that here. Now, uh, we would realize that this would be a pre-salvation struggle that Paul was having with his old man and the idea of keeping the law for salvation, and I'm not able to keep the law for salvation. Uh, but even after we're saved, we're, we struggle, we struggle with uh, this matter of proper spiritual motivation for our life. And uh, if we're not in the, if we're, the Bible tells us if we're not in the spirit, we're in the flesh. And, and they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Uh, certainly, we're not going to have the power of God on us if we're living in the flesh. Uh, and so, obviously, uh, that word flesh has some indication, uh, some connection, a real connection to self. The same letters are in there, aren't they? Uh, flesh and self. Uh, and so, a lot of times, uh, we find ourselves serving uh, from a, a wrong motive. Uh, and it sneaks up on us. I mean, there are, there are various reasons why, uh, you know, we should be serving the Lord. But, uh, you know, a lot of times things creep in. And the next thing you know, uh, we have uh, taken Christ off the throne of our heart and we put ourselves there. Uh, and uh, for one reason or another, for one challenge or another, for one misunderstanding or another, that happens. And so we have to keep ourselves in check. Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to allow the Lord to search us uh, and, uh, lest we usurp the Lord's authority in our life. And, um, you know, uh, I've said before that one of the things that we long for in the Lord is that which is pure. And that burden, that desire for purity is not from the flesh, it's from the Spirit. You and I want something to be pure in Jesus Christ. And if there's any place where we, would, where we should want purity, it should be in our church, in the ministries of our church, in the work of our ministries. Uh, we want to be able to have the purity of God, uh, 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 the, pu the, the purity of holiness in our motives in service for God. And so we're not seeking tonight to examine others, but we're asking God to help us examine ourselves. I don't know how you are, but I, uh, uh, I'm as ornery as a day can be without Christ. <laughs> and my wife will tell you. you just ask her. It's okay. And uh, uh, I need the Lord Jesus Christ to keep me in the right motive, to keep me you know, working for the right reasons. And it doesn't always happen, does it? I mean, there, we'll, we'll look at several examples, but, you know, um, we so quickly can be turned aside into false uh, motives, uh, and it's frightening to think about what motivates some people in their work for the Lord. Well, you know, one thing's for sure: uh, the Bible says that uh, whatever is in our heart will eventually come out in our life. You're not going to be able to hide motives like that forever. Uh, they're going to be revealed, and uh, you and I will then uh, have to deal with that. Uh, but there are a lot of things that motivate people that cause them to engage in various ways and. Uh, uh, and, uh, and be involved in various ways. Uh, some are uh, involved uh, simply for the purpose of e exalting themselves. Now, that's frightening to think about, but it happens. And, and here's the thing. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, uh, ministry that is behind the scenes. We have a lot of behind the scenes people at Maranatha Baptist Church, and, uh, and you wouldn't know. Uh, you know, all that goes on uh, just in a preparation for a worship service like this and folks getting involved and doing their part uh, and uh, you never know who they are sometimes. As a matter of fact, we get that question, who's doing this? Who's doing that? Who's doing the other? And a lot of people say, don't tell people, don't let people know. So, uh, but nonetheless, uh, there are people who are behind the scenes. Uh, but on the other side of that are the aspects of ministry that are very public. And they are seen by people. I've mentioned uh, to you before that uh, when the Lord uh, called uh, me to preach there in uh, 
uh, in the pews of the Faith Baptist Church in, in Misawa, Japan, I remember thinking to myself, it would be a great thing to stand in front of crowds and preach the gospel. And then I found out not long after that, when you stand in front of people, you become a target. <laughs> and maybe not everybody's as excited as you thought they would be about the word of God and the message of the word and all that kind of thing. And so the Lord has a way of reminding you what real ministry is pretty quickly. Um, and so it's not, it's not about uh, being seen. Um, matter of fact, uh, every preacher I know that's being used of the Lord regularly asks themselves, Lord, why do you have me in this place? I, you know, certainly there could be maybe someone better or someone more effective or uh, it's the whole idea of, you know, Moses, the idea that Moses didn't ask for the role God called him to, but it was still his role, and he was, gonna, he was a steward of that, and he had to fulfill it, and, and of course God used him in a great way, and Paul saying, who am I, uh, that type of thing. Uh, but if we're not careful, we can get turned around and start uh, looking for that applause, if you will, looking for that recognition. And one illustration in the Bible for that is Absalom. Maybe you remember Absalom, and, and, uh, and uh, David is the king of Israel, and uh, Absalom is brought in, and the Bible tells us in 2 Samuel 15 in the first six verses that, that Absalom found himself a comfortable place out there in the courts where people would, be, would have to walk by, and he would say, hey, how, how are things faring for you? And, uh, you know, if I were king, I could uh, help you with that. Uh, there's nobody deputed, he said, of the king to take care of you. But I would do that if I had the opportunity. And the whole thing was an undermining process of Absalom where he was trying to gain the seat of his father uh, for self-promotion. And there are really two things wrong with that. One is because David was his father. Honor your father and mother, all right? Secondly, David was the king. And it was David, of course, who said that he would not lay his hand on God's anointed. Uh, and uh, how that, uh, that's to be respected, not undermined. Uh, but Absalom was pitching himself, man. I mean, he was saying, look, uh, things would be a whole lot better if I was in charge. Um, and uh, that happens sometimes. Not maybe to that degree, uh, but there is uh, the danger of self-promotion. Uh, this kind of thing can uh, be dangerous uh, in a church and hurtful to it. Uh, it can cause the individuals to uh, look for places of service for which they're not qualified or suited. Uh, because, hey, look, not everybody's called to preach. And guess what? That's okay. <laughs> There are some places where you go and you get the idea that if every man in the church is not going to the mission field, then none of them are right with God. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, look, uh, hey, God's got a place for everybody. Uh, and, uh, and some people are teachers and some people are not. We went through that when we talked about the gifts of the Spirit. And so outwardly it may look as, uh, 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 as if they are doing the church good, but inwardly, they are wanting to promote themselves. And the illustration that we see of that is 3 John 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Now, you say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. I'm not, I'm not looking for uh, to be uh, on the, you know, preaching. I'm not looking forward to, I don't, I'm not looking for to be on the platform or anything like that. But wait a minute. Do you get upset if you're not recognized? Uh, do you get upset if, if, uh, if, if somebody doesn't pat you on the back regular? You know what I'm saying? Watch out. This thing can be deceitful. Uh, and if we're looking to be, uh, you know, to, to, to have that, and if our feelings are hurt, if we don't have it, then maybe there's a, 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 a poor motive involved in what we're doing. Uh, it, it can also not only cause folks to get into positions that they're not, uh, not suited for, uh, but it can also even, the, the, the burden of it, the desire for it, can cause people to go to great lengths to sacrifice. Uh, like Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, they gave up everything, sold a house, uh, sold a land, lied to God, and all they were trying to do was get recognition like Barnabas. They wanted to be equated with Barnabas. Uh, and so they were looking to promote their own reputation, see. And, of course, the end result, you know, from Acts chapter number 5 is uh, that they ended up uh, promoting their early grave. 
Because God said, look, you've lied to the Holy Ghost. So this idea of when self starts trying to get recognized, uh, it can cause people to give all kinds of money, you know. And I've had people ask over the years, when I look, if I give this amount of money to the church, is my name going to get put on a plaque? Or Can you imagine? Wow. I mean, so I guess my response is the same thing the Lord said. Yeah, we'll be glad to put your name on the plaque, but there won't be any rewards when you get to heaven. Your reward will be that plaque. I'd rather have crowns than plaques. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's, it's crazy what happens. Uh, it can cause folks to give all kinds of time and service and energy. Uh, and, uh, and again, I don't want to focus on folks. I want to focus on us, me, individually. Is that motive in you? Um, uh, does it, uh, is, and, and even in the smallest way, uh, and why? Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. We better watch out. We don't want to promote self. We want self-crucified, uh, that Christ might live through us. And the Lord said, uh, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, if you want the applause of men, then that's all you're going to get, uh, which is kind of crazy because the applause of people is somewhat fickle. I mean, they're applauding one minute and stoning you the next. Just ask, you know, just ask any of God's leaders down through the years. And so uh, think, about the, think about the Lord's words in Mark 9 and 41. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, uh, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. In my name. Not my name, his name. Uh, and I want to uh, serve for that reason. Don't want to promote self. I want to promote the Savior. But I've got to watch out because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked who can know it and so we got to be very careful about self uh, promotion and, and then some people serve to get stuff ain't that crazy uh and uh, uh it might be a shocker to you there are there's a lot of money to be made in the ministry do you know what i mean just well don't but turn on tv and look and filthy lucre uh and um uh, you know, uh, people living these crazy, extravagant lifestyles, uh, it, it really angers me because, uh, you know, of the people who are trying to honor God, who apparently are certainly are deceived, that give all this money, and, uh, and this person or people, whoever they are, man, they're just cashing in, cashing in. Uh, and you have to watch out for covetousness and for materialism and all that kind of thing uh, as motives for our life. There are a lot of people, for instance, uh, you say, well, you, you know, I'm not interested again in, in public ministry in that way, but there are a lot of people who will move from one town to another for a better job opportunity, uh, more money, but never give thought as to whether or not there's a good church there to attend. That's the, that's the money motive. And uh, it shipwrecks a lot of, just like the Bible says, it shipwrecks a lot of people. Uh, our first concern ought to be to honor God. And you can't honor God by neglecting God. <laughs> and, uh, and yet it happens so often. Uh, there are, I know, just uh, by way of kind of continuance of the previous illustration, uh, a, lot of, a lot of preachers that get sidetracked by money, and they start chasing money instead of ministry. And they get two or three jobs, and they're selling insurance and selling cars and all this other kind of thing uh, to, to try to, you know, get a lifestyle. Uh, so, so think about it. Uh, if money is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse 6, uh, that would mean that if what you and I are doing right now is based solely upon money and benefits, it's possible we're out of the will of God. Now, God will take care of you. And that's his, that's, um, that's his promise. But here's the thing. In the end, haven't we seen this over and over again? No amount of money will make you happy. Matter of fact, most times it just makes people miserable and more miserable. Um, no amount of money will soothe a, a guilty conscience. Uh, God will never lead us where his grace won't keep us. So um, uh, somebody said, he who does good just for money will often do evil for higher wages. And so uh, that's true. And the Lord told us you cannot serve God and mammon. All right. And so we've got to be careful. Now, uh, obviously, 
uh, these first two illustrations uh, m- uh, may be less of a concern in some ways uh, for uh, our particular environment, uh, or for our church, or uh, for the people that we know. Uh, but uh, this, this third one kind of strikes us, and that is that uh, some people operate uh, in the work of the Lord almost uh, um, uh, uh, specifically in the, the motive of self-will. This is what I'm going to do. You hear it all the time. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. Very little talk about the Lord and the Lord's will and the Lord's uh, direction and the Lord's calling and the Lord's, this is what I am going to do. That's self-will. And as we've said to you before, as we study Isaiah 14, uh, verses 12 through 15, it's the same motive that drove the devil. He said, I will be exalted above the Most High. Uh, I will be seated there, he said, at the throne of God. Be careful. Be careful. (laughs) I know it's hard. We talked about some of these humbling aspects of biblical doctrine in our Sunday school class this morning. But look, you are not, and I am not, uh, the end all and be all of my life. That's all there is to it. Um, And many times in life, well, we know for the, the scriptural doctrine is, that, that we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Our life is not even ours. Who are we to say, I'm going to do this, you know, or I'm going to do that? Uh, it's not even ours to say. Uh, and so somebody said, self-will is surrounded by a hard head and supported by a stiff neck. <laughs> that, that rings true, doesn't it? Why? Because it disregards what's best for others. Self-will is completely about me. Ministry is not about me. Real Bible ministry is not about me. It's about others. And I can tell you uh, just from my own heart's burden uh, that the things, um, and, and even, uh, even recently, decisions and directions and prayers and, and, and plans, uh, they're for the glory of God and for the good of Maranatha Baptist Church. I, I don't, um, I've told you before, I, I don't, I'm not concerned with what happens to me. If I don't even make it, if I drop dead on this platform, uh, somebody come pray, okay? <laughs> but I'm not worried about that. My life is hid with Christ in God. I, you know, my life is in His hand. But the glory of Jesus Christ through His church is what drives me. Uh, we are so insignificant in the grand scheme of God's work. Uh, and uh, we need to recognize that. That it's not about us. We, we can't just go around disregarding what is best for others. Let nothing be done, Paul said in Philippians, through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. But then, it really, if I get the, all all focused on my will and what I want to do, not only is it not the best thing for others, it's not the best thing for me. See? Because God's plan is the best plan for me. God's will is the best will, uh, the best plan for me, not my will. Uh, be, uh, and so we cannot be motivated by self-will and God's will at the same time. If I'm going to do something just because it's what I want to do, it's possible I get out of the will of God. Uh, and even for all of our good intentions, a lot of time, God has a different plan. And our responsibility is to yield to that plan and do the thing that God wants done. Uh, again, someone said, no man has a right to do as he pleases except when he pleases to do right. <laughs> and that means to, uh, to obey God and follow God and yield self uh, to God. But then also this idea of self-will disregards the brevity of life. Our life is but a vapor. We don't have time to be wasting it living for self. Uh, We must live, of course, for the cause of Christ. Uh, I put it down this way. When I aspire for myself, I may be conspiring against myself uh, because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Uh, And so uh, every false motive in some way will connect to self. And self is so ornery that it's willing to deceive. (laughs) 
I don't want to try to uh, cause us to feel as we walk out tonight that somehow or another we're schizophrenic or something. But the fact of the matter is your flesh is warring against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And you and I have to be careful to yield to the spirit. And the spirit's going to exalt Christ, not self. And so, um, by the way, th th this is where the area of um, a talent can really damage people. Um, you can have a lot of talent, but if, if it's all about your talent and your skill and your knowledge and all your experience and your resume and little about Jesus, man, oh man, you have gotten self in the wrong place, in the wrong place. And so uh, these, this, this, these, this self-life has got to go in the work of the ministry uh, in order for us to uh, honor God. So what kind of motives do we want? Well, uh, we need, in a greater way, a motive of duty. I want to be a dutiful Christian. Uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter number 12 and verse 1 and 2, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God duty it's our duty uh, and the Lord that wants us to be faithful to that duty. Uh, we're, we're the Bible tells us that we are uh, soldiers and therefore we're not to get entangled in the affairs of this life that we may please him who hath called us to be a soldier we need to do our duty as soldiers <laughs> I know uh, I think I've mentioned this before but uh, uh, there in Okinawa we had a whole lot of Marines and it was the first time I'd been in a church with Marines and they're a different breed Amen. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they're, a different, they're a different breed. But my dad was a Marine in Vietnam, so I always appreciated the heritage of the Marine Corps. And, uh, and I, I, at first I was thinking about going into the Marines, and my dad talked me out of it. And I don't know if he did that because of his experience in Vietnam or he just thought I couldn't cut it. But I don't know what it was. But uh, he talked me out of it, and I went into the Air Force. But I always loved the Marine Corps, and um, uh, my grandpa was a Marine. But anyway... So uh, when we got to Okinawa, some of the guys there, I was, trying to, I was trying to see. I asked one of the lieutenant colonels there. I said, hey, is there any way that uh, you guys could work out something here where I could become an honorary Marine? And he said, forget it, fly boy. <laughs> uh, I said, well, I guess I'll just have to go on and be a Marine for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Spiritual Marine, if you will. I want to do my duty. Uh, I want to be faithful. I want to be, uh, you know, I want to be right in my place where I'm supposed to be all the time. Uh, giving it all because we are in a spiritual warfare. Warfare. I want to be a dutiful Christian. Amen. You know, we'll get a lot more done by just being dutiful than, than if we wait for a whim any day of the week. Just being faithful. Um, talked to two or three people this week about the idea of faithfulness. It's being faithful to duty. And uh, we had, had a conversation this week. Somebody said, well, I just feel like I'm working so hard and, uh, and I'm not sure what's getting through. Uh, and I, I, I had the opportunity to say, look, look, the labor is producing fruit. The labor produces fruit. Even if you don't see the fruit immediately, your duty for the Lord will produce fruit. Uh, if not visibly in somebody else, which most of the time that's happening also, you just may not see it. But it will also produce it in you. In you. The fruit of the Spirit working in you, just being dutiful week in, week out, uh, Sunday in, Sunday out, month in, month out, year after year after year, faithfulness to God always gains spiritual ground and produces spiritual fruit. But you got to be dutiful. you got to show up. And we need, uh, we need an attitude of duty. And we don't have that anymore much in our society anyway, do we? Um... All the time now, probably you, many of you are impacted by it almost weekly. You got some appointment somewhere, and uh, somebody, somebody told me uh, they had a dental appointment this week, showed up for the appointment, and uh, people had called out. They're already sitting there, waiting on it, and, and never got a call. Where's somebody's duty? Why didn't somebody feel some sense of responsibility for somebody else? Uh, we've got a job to do, and we need to be faithful to it. Uh, but then not just duty, but uh, I want to have uh, a willingness. 
not driven by rules like we said this morning, but driven by my fellowship with Christ. A, a heart to the work of the Lord. That's a right motive. David had a, you know, David was, man, uh, was known as a man after God's own heart. The psalmist said, I delight to do thy will. Amen? Yeah, I want to do, I want to serve God. It's not just a matter of me, uh, you know, showing up mechanically, uh, but uh, I want the, the mechanism of it to be from a, a, a heart of desire for Him, a desire to be obedient to Him. Uh, and, of course, we can't have that if we're focused on self all the time. I delight to do thy will, O God. Now, somebody said, well, now, hold on. Uh, the ministry's not all... I've got to stand still now. No. Uh, 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 the, uh, the ministry's not easy. It's tough. People don't always do what you want them to do. <laughs> You're kidding. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, look, what, yeah, I delight. Hold on. Hold on. That, that statement, I delight to do thy will, O God, is quoted uh, uh, in, in connection with Jesus Christ going to the cross of Calvary. You and I have faced nothing like that. And so if Jesus could go to the cross and say, I delight to do thy will, O God, we can put up with whatever is necessary to get her done around here. Amen. And be glad about it. I delight to do thy will. There was a time when I didn't. You know, I mean, uh, not from a Christian standpoint, I was unsaved, I didn't even think about God. My greatest delight was living for me. And then the Lord gave, the, after salvation, the Lord gives you a greater purpose for life. And I think about how many times, because of faith in Christ now, I wasn't down at the bar. And I wasn't drunk out of my mind. And I had my mind, and I served the Lord. And uh, I remember uh, under Pastor Harold, I got the opportunity to start with the youth group. And, uh, and boy, I'd preach to those teens. I'd go get them. I'd get the church van. I'd run and go get all of them. Bring them to church because some of the parents wouldn't bring them. Hello? So I'd go get them. Not, I wouldn't steal them. I'd ask them, can I go? <laughs> <Can I? laughs> and I'd bring a van load every Sunday in there. And, buddy, I'm telling you, I remember one time we did a, uh, we did a youth event, and it was going to be one of those... Uh, uh, all night things, you know, and, uh, and we had promoted it and tried to encourage teens to come. And man, I'm telling you, we showed in, uh, showed up that night, uh, and 40 teenagers came in there. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, we, we had a group of about the size we have here at the time. And, buddy, I was shocked. And I looked at my wife, I said, This is going to be a long night. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> But we, we fellowshiped and we uh, uh, enjoyed each other's company. We preached the word of God. Two or three of them got saved that night. And when you come to the end of it, uh, I remember they did one one night. Uh, I'm not sure I was, I don't think I was doing that one. Maybe Brandon was doing it because Brandon was our youth director over at Okinawa. And he did an all night thing one night and they had a big earthquake during that thing. I mean, it was one of those ones when the chandeliers were shaking like this, you know. Uh, and uh, what a blessing it was to hear those testimonies the next uh, day while we were putting them on the bus and sending them home, you know. Uh, but the fact of the matter is time is all done. You're weary uh, and your mind is tired and your body's tired. Uh, you can't hardly think. But, brother, it's a blessing to do the will of God. I delight to do thy will. That's a good motive. And uh, we need to delight to do it. Uh, and, uh, and we will delight to do it if we will love him first. The love of Christ constraineth us. Now, there's a lot of reasons in this world to quit the work of the Lord. Sometimes the weariness of it. Sometimes the waywardness of it. You know, um, uh, some, Sometimes the, the, just the, um, the wariness of it. Uh, the, the challenge of always trying to make sure everything's in order and everything is as it should be for the sake of others, for the testimony of the Lord. Uh, uh, there, there, there is what appears to be sometimes the fruitlessness of it, you know, um, uh, in our work for the Lord, as we mentioned a, a minute ago. What is it that helps us take those steps? What is it that helps us want and desire? What is it that moves us to duty? if not love for Christ. Love for Him. Uh, 
the church we went to Sunday, they sang a song that's very familiar. I hadn't heard it in a while, but they were singing about, you know, I wasn't there when the Lord was crucified, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't there when they buried him. I wasn't there when he rose the third day. But I was there when he saved my soul. When he forgave me of a life of wickedness and darkness. And even in the times of my Christian life when I haven't been as dedicated or committed or devotional as I should be, He has been faithful and long-suffering and patient. And as hard as we wrestle with the flesh, do we not still cry out in the depths of our heart, I love you, Lord. I love you. And that love motivates everything else. The greatest thing that a servant of the Lord can do is be completely lo uh, in love with Jesus Christ. And if you, can, if you can settle that in your heart, you'll find strength you never knew you had. You'll find joy you never knew you had if you love Him first. Why do we do what we do? Why? <laughs> oh, my heart's blessed. I chuckle when I think about all the folks involved in our children's ministries. I mean, so I don't have to tell you nothing. But sometimes we got a tough crowd around here in these children's <laughs> ministries. And I just, every week of my life, I watch y'all. And my heart is blessed. And I hear you talking about your love for these children, your love for their soul, uh, your love for their families. And that comes from a love for God. And it's that love that can, you know, I've often said, I don't know why in the world anybody comes back. <laughs> the bus children, the leaders, <laughs> why in the world does anybody come back? Well, uh, because Jesus, Jesus is the love of their life. And that blesses my heart. That is the vital motive for your life. Do you love him? Look, if you don't, everything about your Christian life just devolves into religion. And it becomes cold, and it becomes stale, and it becomes boring, um, uh, and it can almost get irritating <laughs> if you don't love him. But if you do, none of that. None of that. Every week, of, every day as I serve him, every week of my life as I work in my church, uh, the love of Christ motivates me. It's the love of Christ, by the way, that helps us be willing to put those protections in place for our life so that our testimony is what it should be because we love Him first. His testimony matters above ours. And once we catch that, setting our testimony in order is not difficult at all because of love for Him. Do we really love Him? Do we? That's the highest motive of all. That's what Jesus went, that's what um, uh, moved Christ to go to the cross of Calvary. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. See? Uh, it's the motive for giving. We're getting ready to come in our missions conference, and so many of you are faithful week in, week out, and your tithes and offerings and all that. What, what, you know, um, uh, it's the motive for giving uh, that, we, that if we love, we give. All of it love. In the end, and ma matter of fact, uh, we're reminded in 1 Corinthians 13 that if we don't have love, it profits nothing. Get it? Because without that love, the only thing left is self. And those motives, we just said, are not the motives that get the spiritual work of God done. Love the Lord with all your heart. Uh, and God will give you that wisdom, that strength, that direction, that provision, that protection that you need to honor Him with the testimony and work of your life. Let's stand together, please. Would you, with me?